Recognized, Uncle Walker, D, 0, 1. Recognized, Emily of Arden, D, 1, 2. Hello, team. Welcome to Comic Commentary, tie-in issues 14 and 15. In this series, we'll be reviewing the Young Justice tie-in comics that folded directly into the story arcs of the animated series. My name's Rich, and I'm here with my amazing trash co-host, <laughs> Emily. <laughs> the thing that makes that make sense is going to end up in the blooper reel. <laughs> That's right. I'm very excited today, everyone. Okay, so hi, everybody. I'm very excited. And in Comics Commentary, we will be discussing how the Italian comics relate to the video game, the first two seasons of Young Justice, and the broader DC universe. But unlike our regular review episodes, we won't be having a Crashing the Mode segment, so consider this your spoiler warning. If you would like to get in touch with the trash hosts that are us, you can find us on Twitter at the YJ Files, on Facebook at Crashing the Mode. All this will make sense in a few minutes. On our website, CrashingTheMode.com, on the YJFiles.tumblr.com, at our email address, whelmedpodcast at gmail.com, and now streaming at CrashingTheMode.com slash YouTube. And with all that out of the way, let's hand it back to Emily for... Hello, Megan! So in this episode, we are talking about issues 14 and 15, Under the Surface and Here There Be Monsters. The issues were released on March 21st and April 18th of 2012. The timestamps in universe are September 4th through September 7th. And the episode tie-in is that it starts just after the end of Bereft and ends just before the start of Targets. The writers for these issues were Greg Weissman and Kevin Hopps. The penciler was the amazing Christopher Jones. The inker was also the amazing Christopher Jones. The colors were Zach Atkinson, and the letter was, again, Desi Santi. Just in time for your next mission. The establishing shot for this issue is that somewhere in the Atlantic Ocean, we see Calder's friend Topo running for his life from a group of hooded humanoids. Unfortunately, he is cornered, and his fate is left to our imagination as we cut to Mount Justice. I probably should have wrote swimming for his life. I thought that when I was reading it and then didn't say yeah, it. Yeah, probably. Yeah, sorry, Topo. <laughs> we cut to Mount Justice where Robin, Kid Flash, and Artemis are leaving the cave for home, but are worried about Aqualad, who is still recovering from their desert mission in Bereft. Once the trio Zeta home, Aqualad invites Superboy and McGann to join him back in Atlantis. When asked why he didn't invite the entire team, Calder admits his concerns about the extreme pressures of being in the ocean affecting the other team members. We then cut to the three of them arriving at the city-state of Shearisk, Calder's birthplace, and we get to meet his parents. We also see McGann's body shrink and compact because of the pressure underwater, which uh, we later see in season two. But we see it as early as this, which is pretty cool. And this is and this these comics came out before season two, yeah. right? So this is actually the first time we've seen that. Yeah, amazing. Connor dons a rebreather and a wetsuit while McGann gives herself gills. And before they head for Poseidonus, Calder is warned by his father to be careful because he's heard rumors of unrest in the city. At the Conservatory of Sorcery in Poseidonus, Calder introduces McGann and Connor to his friends Ronald, Blubber, Lori Lamaris, Lagan, and Nanao Sha'ark. <laughs> Just after Garth and Tulo arrive, that's the, way it's, that's the way it's written. Just after Garth and Tulo arrive, the group sees Topo and discovers that he had been branded by the group we saw earlier. This is when we learn several things about Atlantis. One, that Atlanteans were once surface dwellers that used science and sorcery and possibly metagene manipulation, I'm guessing, to adapt to their underwater environment. And two, some Atlanteans look like Aquaman, i.e. Tula and Garth, and are referred to by a racist or, I don't know, specist? I think it was more like spe specist? Maybe. Group called the Purists as purebloods, while anyone who does not look human, including Calder, because his gills are visible, are labeled as impure. After Tula and Garth catch our team up on the local tensions that have been going on, they come across Lori, Lagan, Blubber, Topo, and King Shark clashing with Ronald and three other purists. After accusations are made about Topo's branding and a near lethal confrontation between King Shark and Ronald, the team intervenes and the groups disband. We then cut to a cave where a group of purists in full robes are being addressed by Ocean Master. Ocean Master is stirring the racial prejudice, claiming that since their king is a pureblood, he will approve of ridding the capital of impure people. 
We get a single frame of Ocean Master removing his helmet to reveal himself as Prince Orm just before he leads a group of purists to kidnap Queen Mira. Queen Mira, we cut to the next issue. Queen Mira projects a magical warning to Calder before being knocked unconscious by Ocean Master, who wields a magical artifact called Neptune's Trident. When the team attempts to save her, Ocean Master knocks them unconscious as well. Calder wakes to the face of Prince Orm, who tells them his sources inform him that there are two potential places the queen may be held. Orm says he'll take a group of soldiers to one while Calder and the team investigate the other. Of course, Prince Orm, being Ocean Master, orders an ambush of the team and their allies. Back in the cave where the pregnant Queen Mira is being held, Ocean Master uses Neptune's trident to steal her magical energy and life force and use it to cleanse the impure, or at least weaken them. During the ambush, the team allows a few of the Paris to escape so that McGann can follow them to the location of the Queen in said cave. While Ocean Master monologues to Queen Mera about his plan to kill her and the baby, along with the impure in Poseidonus, sending Aquaman into grief and starting a chaotic civil war, Ronald overhears the plan and realizes that he's been manipulated. He tries to stop Ocean Master from killing the queen and helps distract him while the team arrives. Connor's rebreather is immediately destroyed by Ocean Master because that's the that was the smartest thing he's done this whole time. True. Just just before uh, he uh, manifests a giant squid construct to attack everyone. <laughs> before Connor can drown, uh, McGann swims up to him and gives him mouth to mouth and leaves me screaming internally because I'm trash. <laughs> we'll get to, we'll get to why we're we're both trash here. We're in a minute. so excited for these issues, guys. <laughs> Meanwhile, Garth summons the power of the Tempest, breaking Ocean Master's concentration and dispelling his spells, including the one weakening the Queen. Ocean Master escapes now that the Queen is free, and he is significantly overpowered. Later in the throne room, the team updates Aquaman about their adventure, while Orm claims that he'll deal with the traitors who led us both into ambush, even though, you know, he's Ocean Master. <laughs> the team then returns to the surface so that Connor and McGann can attend their first day of high school because <laughs> this all happened in one long weekend, apparently. Right. Because it's a game of masks. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. I love it so much. <laughs> awesome. Are we feeling any aster for these episodes? My, these issues? <laughs> my, my, these episodes slash issues, my co- also, trash like me. Oh, we're, <laughs> so, we're so excited for such different reasons, and I can't wait to talk right. about this. I can't wait to talk all about right, these issues. Let's dive in. Superboy, are you all right? I'm fine. Feeling the aster. All right, before, before I let Emily off the hook, though, real quick, I do need to mention that there was another subplot going on, but I didn't put it in the, in the write-up, though. The, the subplot... I don't, I'm not even sure why it was there. Oh, I, right. It, it was, I, it, I forgot this was a subplot until you mentioned it. It's not even a subplot. It was just these couple of scenes that came in Yeah. that it, were, were showing Tio Morrow uh, collecting this older gentleman from like a, an old folks home and then unburying Firebrand from the past and like helping them both realize that they were robots and, you know, and, and leading us into, you know, the uh, family reunion episodes of... Front. Yeah. With red, red tornado. Didn't have anything to do with anything that was going on in these issues. It was just in there. So, um, yeah, anyway, but I wanted to mention that it was there. Somebody somebody felt that we needed to explain how we got these robots. Yeah, I mean, it's cute. It's just a weird, it's just weirdly placed. Yeah. It's cute, he says, of the subplot where two people dig up a dead body and. <laughs> yeah, and carve off their own skin. Yeah. yeah. It's cute. <laughs> Yeah, I completely forgot that was a subplot in this in these issues yeah. until well, you mentioned it. Because it doesn't have anything to do with anything. Yep. Anyway, it's all good. I just wanted to make sure that people knew that that was happening in the background, and we're probably we've just addressed it as much as I think we're going to address yeah. it because there isn't yeah. much going on. All right, okay, fine. You're officially you you trash it up first because <laughs> I'm gonna I'm gonna trash it up later. Oh, I'm just so excited. So, I starting with some of the smaller things in this issue. I really love the way McGann uses her powers in this arc. I keep saying that about the, about the issues. I feel like the comics just came up with really interesting ways for her to use her powers that didn't always mm -hmm. come up in the show. I agree. Like, we acknowledge that she shrinks under high pressure, which we see in season two, but it's cool seeing it in the comics this early. 
uh, and we have her shape shifting to make herself aquatically capable and able to breathe underwater, which I'm like, yes, of course, that is what you're going to do. We get the right. first hints of her mental translation abilities that also show up in season two uh, more prominently. And she becomes a mermaid because why not? Like if I had that ability, yeah. same, I would absolutely right. do the exact same thing. <laughs> What I think is interesting and what I really like is the fact that she doesn't do that right off the yeah. bat. She gives herself gills, but then she makes herself almost like she's echoing um, Calder more than anything else until she sees Lori and then does something that seemed like weirdly, <laughs> like, is that cultural appropriation? What is that? Because Lori looked a little bit uncomfortable with what was going on there. I think uh, part of it was that no one shapeshifts in Atlantis. So it was just the thing of immediately meeting someone and they're like, hi, I can just change everything about me and being like oh okay then uh well but see that's interesting because they're all students at the conservatory they've seen stuff like that before have they though is this a common thing people can do with magic well it gets we assume okay it gets we're we're we're, we're taking a sidestep into my trash go for it yeah well so so ronald okay guys i don't know why anybody <laughs> would not know this by this point uh, I'm I'm kind of known as the the aquatic gaming guy in the RPG community. So having a pair of episodes issues. that have adorable that too <laughs> issues, I'm not even going to try anymore. <laughs> have a couple of issues <laughs> that have some adorable Super Martian moments, and it's all set underwater. Are like two issues <laughs> that were written for us. It's ridiculous. We're both so happy for different reasons. Anyway, so. Ronald, the character of Ronald in here, who who's another quote unquote pure blood, just terrible. In the comics, is actually a merfolk like Lori. In fact, they they are married in the comics or got married, and he was a shapeshifter too. So he used magic to shapeshift and stuff. So though we don't see it in here, like it's a thing, it's a shtick, you know, that happens. And yeah, I guess her surprise could be that someone shapeshifts, but I don't think that was the implication. The implication was like. Okay, I guess that's what? I guess that's a thing. Now? I'd be I'd be confused too. Yeah, sure. That's fair. <laughs> that's fair. I also love we get we get to meet Calder's parents in this in this one or who we assume are his parents at this point. We get to meet his mom well, and his adoptive father, we could right. say. Uh, and I I don't think we have any answers to that. Like is is she really his I think she's really mom? his mom. I think she's really So she cool. you think she had a thing with Black Manta? Maybe? Like I don't know. The show and the comics are all very vague about the, about <laughs> very vague. Where Calder yeah. is from? I don't know. He's supposed to be That's why I put quote unquote birthplace in the uh, in the write up because we don't I mean, I'm assuming that's his mom and that Calvin Durham showed up and fell in love with her and then all the stuff that happened with him, yeah. but I it's all it's all just it's all very vague. But hypothesis. Yeah. Either I have way, no idea. I love his parents in this issue. They're only here for a Me little too. bit, but it's really cute. And like I would love yeah. more of that. I know we're probably never gonna get more of them, especially because of all of the crazy tension in season two with Aqualad and parentage, but like they're so cute. He shows up and his parents are just like, Have you been having fun? Have you been eating right? Being a superhero, <laughs> are you okay, son? And I'm like, this is adorable. <laughs> right, right, right. Um, <laughs> uh, and okay so another little thing about miss martian in this issue we were talking about how a large portion of this issue is about the racial tension among atlanteans but at first calder is like nah everybody's chill with each other it's super chill every everybody's super diverse and everybody's great about it because that's how calder sees it until really bad stuff starts happening in this arc and after he talks about this and talks about how all of these people from all of these different cities and different cultures all coexist mcgann has a line where she just says it's wonderful my world could take lessons my world should take lessons and yeah. i feel and i continue to feel so bad for her and her screwed up childhood and also this issue was released post image so we knew by this point what was up with her mm -hmm. and reading that and seeing that any time McGann is exposed to cultures where people are accepted, she is yeah. floored by this as a concept and it hurts me. Correct me if I'm wrong. Were these two issues the two you started with? 
Sort of. Uh, I mentioned this. Okay. I have this later in my notes, but I will talk about it now. Uh, the first two comics I ever bought in my life as comics, as individual comics, were issues 13 and 14. So the last issue of ah. the previous arc and the first issue of this arc. And I had read the first couple of issues of the Young Justice comics as a graphic novel, but Young Justice was why I went into a comic book store and bought physical comics as individual issues for the first time. And right. this arc, this two issue arc of 14 and 15 was definitely what convinced me that I needed to come back every month and keep reading. And yeah. Because the universe aligned and was like, oh, we're getting this girl into a comic book store. We're giving her exactly what she wants to make her come back. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, no, these were these were my my first comics were these these individual issues. And yeah, I remember and have very fond memories of very young me reading these for the first time and absolutely falling in love with comics and with these comics specifically. Yeah. And the fact that Miss Martian is at the center of a lot of it is is no accident for why I loved it so much. <laughs> well, I was thinking like earlier the way that you were talking about the way that they were using her powers and some of those ways we found out about in season two. I didn't start reading the comics until after the show was over. Yeah. So when I was reading this, I was like, oh, yeah, of course. But then I was thinking like as you were reading this, I was like, oh, a lot of this like the mental translation thing and the being crushed down you know, under the pressure and all that kind of stuff. When you were first reading this, you hadn't seen that. So that was all new, yes. which is so, which is interesting. Season two started just a couple weeks after issue 15 came out. So we were at the tail end of season one Got when it. these were coming out. Perfect. Yeah. So I just wanted to check that because my, like my emotional memory of these issues might not have lined up with like the actuality of things. I just wanted to check that. But yes, this was pre-season two so we hadn't seen a lot of stuff so this was also going with that this was our introduction to Lagan in some ways uh before we were introduced to Lagan. oh that's yeah that's he right he makes an appearance in the show in season one as a background person in downtime right but uh he's here as does in Lori this. as well he asks if if Connor and McGann are what most people from the surface world look like and they're both like uh, it's complicated it's complicated <laughs> but yeah and in that in that same scene i also just think it's really cute that miss martian mentions that she's always loved mermaids because it's just such a precious little teenage thing to have her as one of the things she likes and it just melted my heart see the, one of the things that's interesting too is this this mars thing because because there's the, there's some implication in the comics that when john jones gets grabbed by this teleporter thing and pulled he's pulled through time and space from mars onto earth and then he realizes that like his whole civilization's gone so you don't know exactly when he's from but it but here they're talking about no the martian civilization lives under the surface so there's no oceans unless there's some submerged ocean like where are they getting water from and stuff so like all that kind of stuff like if she'd heard about mermaids and just even the ocean itself, you'd think that that would be absolutely fascinating for her, you know? And I just had a revelation as we were talking about this because those happen sometimes. Mm. And as people know, I like fairy tales and I like reimagined fairy tales. And it just dawned on me that the cultural implications of mermaids in general and the stories that we as a culture tell about mermaids now are about transforming yourself in new worlds to uh... become what you want to be. So, of course, uh, Miss Martian likes mermaids. What? Mermaids get to That's escape true. from the world they're born into to find other worlds and look the way mm -hmm. they want to look. Oh, you're stepping in my trash again because I got a whole Lori Lamar's Lam Lam thing going want, on right you now. You want to go off on mermaids? Go. Like, I'm not going to uh, stop you. No, there's a lot. I got, I got stuff. Okay. I got stuff. Lori's a, like a whole thing. So, let, let, let's, uh, you got. I gotta get you got a few things I gotta, to say. I have a few things to say. <laughs> Before I go off on my few things to say, I do want to point out that it made me laugh quite a bit that while Ocean Master is monologuing about how he's going to take over the ocean or whatever his grand plan is, he literally stops at one point and just goes, I am a cliche. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm like, at least you're self aware of your own bad choices. <laughs> so yeah. that amused me. But 
Aside from all of these things, my real favorite reason for absolutely loving these two issues is all of the Super Martian, and no one is surprised, but it's true. No, no one's surprised. You can't be, no one listening to us can be surprised about what we're excited about in this issue. So you just dive in. No excuses. Okay, so this issue, these two issues are set right between bereft and targets. So even just going into this issue, there's a lot of tension going on in this mission, considering bereft ended with them almost kissing and not getting that chance and moving on with their lives. And by targets, people are assuming Connor is her boyfriend. First day of school, and people are just like, he, you're dating him, right? Like, that's that's the situation? Because <laughs> he's yet. cute, but he's a little bit, what did, what did, they say? What did Bumblebee say? <laughs> Is that your boyfriend? Because he's hot, but kind of a freak. <laughs> kind of a freak, that's what it was. Oh, Karen, and this Martian I love you, doesn't Karen. tell her she's wrong. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> um, but... <laughs> So this, I love Bumblebee. She's in this great. She's, she's so great. Good. But in between the chaos of those two episodes, of their all of all of their pre actual relationship tension, there's this. There's this little thing, and there are so many cute little background things outside of the thing at the end that makes me scream like a child. Like he's the one who points out that she's shorter in the bio ship, and that just means he's. He's aware of it. He's aware of her. It's cute. Right. And he even says that her giving herself gills is a nice touch. And I think it's sweet. And that's also later followed up by when she turns into a mermaid. Connor's only comment is, now you're just showing off. I like it. <laughs> uh, which is just the freaking <laughs> cutest telepathic flirting ever. And I approve. And But on a more serious note on it, narratively, with this is all right after he has found out that she is actually a white Martian posing as a green oh, Martian. that's right. So, that's right. like, you can read these moments of him acknowledging, like, the ways that she is using her powers as him subtly reassuring her that he's completely chill with her being able to change forms at any given time. Yeah. And that's a good point. I somebody pointed that out online one time, and it I was like, oh my god, that's the cutest thing, because it's true. He's he doesn't need to compliment her at every turn, but he does, and it's cute. And he just wants to reassure right. her that like I see what you can do, I see what you're doing, and I'm not upset by it. I don't care, and it's very yeah. very sweet. I love it. They also keep up an ongoing private mental link throughout this whole arc. Like they have conversations yeah. that Calder's not a part of. I was wondering about that when I first read through it. There's that scene where she's like, this is why he invited us along because he didn't want to come back here with Tula and Garth and be by himself. And I was like, can he hear them? And then I realized that there were different colors and stuff. So I was like, oh, interesting. I love I love how they represent the mental communications in the comics, by the way. Like, I'm not sure if we've ever actually talked about that, but they give everybody an individual mm. dialogue color for the thought bubbles right. and it's cute but yeah the two of them have an ongoing private mental link throughout all of this that we then later see in targets they have that when they go to school and i like that they this is apparently like post bereft this just became a thing that they did <laughs> that right. they just talk to each other like this and i think it's i think it's sweet and when the she breaks up a fight between the shark guy and uh ronald shark his name is Shark and Ronald. Connor runs in and is like, uh, leave her alone. You don't get to devour my future girlfriend. That's not chill. You don't get to kill her. Uh, <laughs> and that's just fun. But he then also has to do the exact same thing when they go to fight Ocean Master and she almost gets killed again. And Connor does what Connor does, which is rush in to save his girlfriend at any given moment. Because that is that is Connor's rage button. If you threaten McGann, he will almost definitely destroy you. To to be fair, he has a few rage buttons. True, true. They're all they're all clustered really close yeah, together. Yeah, that's one of still. his sure ones, though. Like even like For sure. the one I always reference is if you look at like the fight at the end of season one where they're fighting the Justice League. Connor is extremely calm until Superman punches Miss Martian across the room. And that's when oh, well, that's Superboy fair. Yeah. is like, okay, no, <laughs> done. No hurting her. That's totally fair. And of course, all of this leads up to the big giant underwater kiss that leaves me incoherently screaming every time I read these issues. And it's so perfect. And I love it. It's not a kiss. It's mouth to mouth. But like, you can say that. 
<laughs> and I can understand that from professionally speaking. From professionally speaking, began is through superhero science, making sure Connor doesn't drown by use of mouth to mouth and gills. Right. And like, yeah, I, I, I'm, I like had to hold off on like, oh, do I talk about this gill lung? Does she had air in her residual lungs for two days? And where's the oxygen coming from? She's giving to him and. Like, it's like my marine biologist and my, like, superhero geek and my aquatic geek and, like, just all, like, clashing in my head. And I'm like, just let it go. It's a big kiss. <laughs> it's because you can tell me whatever you want and I can understand it as that. But they're teenagers and this, no matter what is actually happening right. <laughs> internally for them, this is. Yeah. <laughs> and I think it's hilarious because it's like. They have had all of this tension building up to this, and they end up making out underwater because she needs to make sure he doesn't die. <laughs> right. And it also, I find it hilarious that if you look in the background of the rest of the fight scene where everyone is actually oh, yeah. fighting Ocean Master, they're just drawn awkwardly in the corner, <laughs> right. still right. doing this. <laughs> and in the, the very last scene, actually, one of the very last scenes of the actual book, Connor's smiling at her and she's like, like looking away. She's, she's just staring at the ground. I'm like, yeah, no, this is precious. <laughs> and to me, it adds, as we keep saying with these issues, it adds another layer to targets for me because it's just like right. this is now hanging over them and they are going into school and people are assuming they're dating and they haven't actually had that conversation. And does this count as a kiss? And are we together now? What is up with this? So right. it adds that other layer of like, we're, we really need to just figure some stuff out and we're not going to until we're in prison and we go to therapy. With Hugo Strange. With Hugo Strange. And Yee. the other thing about these issues that made me laugh that I noticed at the beginning and I love that they acknowledge by the end of the last issue is that, <laughs> that they end this issue the morning that they're supposed to go into school. <laughs> right. And I'm like, you guys stayed up way past midnight fighting underwater supervillains. You must be so tired on your first day of school. <laughs> you poor children. What's better than breaking cur curfew to beat on an anthropomorphic triceratops? <laughs> Shout out to nerds on a roll. <laughs> it's totally true. Oh my God. Yeah. So like I'm, I was thinking about that kiss thing and I was just like, I, I, I'm, now I'm thinking like, basically I was telling myself, don't, th don't throw out Emily's trash. <laughs> It's like, your favorite trash. It's my favorite <laughs> trash. No, but like, I can acknowledge that it is supposed to just be mouth to mouth to save Connor's life. I can also acknowledge that these two idiots are also mentally t connected during this whole thing and probably having a very awkward telepathic equivalent <laughs> of like, I can't even look uh, you in the mental eye right now because what the, what the heck are we doing? Why is this happening? <laughs> yeah. That's pretty funny. I love it. <laughs> and that's, <laughs> thank you for coming to my lecture on how these issues are really cute. And I am very easily amused by these two idiot alien <laughs> sweethearts. Is it time for my wet trash now? Go for it. <laughs> it's my, my trash time. All right. So all of this aquatic stuff was awesome. I loved even little stuff like Calder's, you know, being concerned about rightfully so really like, you know, Robin and Kid Flash and, you know, ignoring our own <laughs> uh, masks, say. masks game. <laughs> One of my notes for these issues was literally like, well, there they go and validating our whole one shot. <laughs> right. <laughs> Well, I don't know how deep they are, though, because you, you know, 200 meters is the photic zone where the sun reaches down and it's pretty lit the whole time. And so, I it's don't fine. know. I mean, it wouldn't be comfortable. It's fine. But it's but at least like a mention was yeah. made, which I think is actually pretty cool. And then there was all kinds of there was all kinds of like nods and Easter eggs. And I, so in it, depending on where you look, Atlantis either had seven or nine like. The continent of Atlantis had seven or nine little, like, country slash countries, I guess you'd call them. And there's a bunch of different individual cities all over the place, stuff like that. So what it seems to be is they took areas like Shearis, which was like this hidden colony in the comics, and they made it into a city-state. And so at some point in time, one of the, the purists was talking about Tritonus, Nanao, uh, Neptunus, Lem Lemuria, Shearis and Crastinus, 
and then we already have Poseidonus as well. So there's there's apparently seven city states in the Young Justices Atlantis, and there are a few references here. So so Lori and uh, Ronald are actually in the comics from Tritonus, and as I mentioned earlier, Ronald's actually a merfolk like Lori in the comics, and he's like a powerful sorcerer, and he's like a villain, and blah blah blah. Nanao isn't isn't a comics thing. That Nanao is the name of the Hawaiian mythological shark men, which is where King Shark's name comes from. And King Shark claims in the comics that he's the son of the god of sharks. And but no, there's, I don't know if there, there's been any proof of that. They either think he's a mutant or something like that. But is there a whole country of him? And that's interesting. And he calls himself King Shark. So is he like the prince? Like, I'm not sure what's going on with King Shark in this. And of course, he's a villain in the comics. And here, I'm unconvinced that he's a villain. And if he does become a villain as the show goes on, maybe it's because of some craziness with these, you know, purists and stuff. Could be interesting. I could see it. Neptunus, I, I, I couldn't find anything on <laughs> Neptunus. I'd never heard of it. So I think that was new for Young Justice. Lemuria, they're like blue-skinned humanoids, scaled blue-skinned, powerful sorcerers in the comics. Shearis, uh, like I, we mentioned before, is where Calder's from. And the original, sort of, the original Garth is technically from Shearis as well, sort of. But he's technically from a, a little sub area of Shearis called Crastinus. So in there, the pure the purists are actually the very last thing they said. Like you, you fish heads have invaded all of the <laughs> all of the seven city states of Atlantis. Let me name them for the readers. <laughs> and uh, but at the end, they say even Crastinus. And I was like, well, I've never heard of Crastinus. I don't know what that is. They seem to be putting some emphasis on it. So I did a little research. In the comics, one of the hidden bases of the ideal uh, idolists or idealists that was a subculture of Shearis was the culture that the actual literal like village culture basically that Garth was born into. And they're so xenophobic that when Garth was born and he has those purple lavender eyes that you see in the animated series, they threw him out on a mercy reef to die and then Aquaman found him. Um, I talk a little bit about more about that in our Aqualad Secret Origins episode. But they're so xenophobic, they couldn't even handle his eye color. So if this purist is saying, like, you guys have even invaded, you know, Crastinus, that's what he's, that's what they're referring to, is the fact that these people are so xenophobic and you're, you're there as well, which was, which is so, int- I don't know, there's so many, like, little interesting nods to the history of DC Comics in here. And then, then they're all his friends, right? So Blubber, terrible name, guys. <laughs> But in the comics, Blubber is actually, he's basically an uplifted, intelligent whale with uh, knowledge of advanced technology. I think he's got like a powered suit at some point. And he's like a, <laughs> seriously. And so he's also like Lagan's best friend, which I thought was kind of cute. So I'd like to see some more of that <laughs> buddy cop team. <laughs> you know, you get a whale in powered armored suit coming above the surface with Lagan taking care Lagan of business. He's who Lagan went and cried to after him and Miss Martian broke up. Oh, 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 oh. He's a big cuddly whale. They went and had, of like, course that's what you're going to do. Underwater ice cream and cried about their feelings. <laughs> that could have happened. <laughs> so, Lori, I mentioned her a little bit in our episode of Downtime because she shows up. She's the one who cast the spell at the beginning and she says, Did it work? I can't tell if it worked, which was supposed to be, I guess, a translation spell that worked for the listeners, for the watchers. <laughs> so, she couldn't, so that we could understand the Atlantean, which I thought was kind of a funny little cute twist. But in the in the comics, so she was created back in the 1950s, I want to say, early 60s, late 50s. In the original story, she was actually a college student, a wheelchair-bound college student that went to university with Clark Kent. And they started dating while he was in college. And they date, they, they go out, and, but she just kept not showing up to their dates. <laughs> and so after all of this, like, you know... <laughs> this drama and whatever, he finds out that she's been wearing this blanket over her legs the whole time because she's a mermaid because 1958 or whatever it was. So um, her later appearances kind of fall into what you were talking about earlier, this idea of becoming what you want. So she has this magical ability or whatever it happens to be that when she comes out of water, she actually, her tail transforms into legs and that she could travel, that she could go around and do things. And she shows up in the comics periodically as one of Clark's exes, along with Lana and, and Lois, obviously. Because he only dates women with double L names. 
the alliteration. Yeah, and somebody, one of our listeners too, pointed out that there's another one too. I always thought it was just Lana and um, Lori and Lois, but apparently there was another one, and I can't remember her name. And what gets even weirder and creepier is that it's like it was his cousin before Kara came into the comics. So it just gets really uncomfortable. Yes. No, 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 no. Emily's shaking her head. Yeah, it's weird. Anyway, so there's a lot of them. And then, of course, you have Lex Luthor. And, like, there's just, I don't know what the deal was with the LLs in Superman. But <laughs> I don't know. I think, so, I'm sure somebody's on a PhD dissertation on it. But anyway, that's kind of the story with Lori. In, in here, she's a sorceress. In the comics, I don't think she is, but... I think it works really, really well with Young Justice. And then I already talked about <laughs> Nanao Shark. Uh, yeah, with King Shark. I think that was a bit of a uh, drawing at straws there. <laughs> but they kind of pushed that in there and made that work a little bit as an introduction to who King Shark was. What do we name the shark guy? Shark. <laughs> shark. <laughs> What's he in the comics, King Shark? What's his real name in the comics, King Shark? <laughs> Like he has no he doesn't have a secret identity. He's just a big shark guy. Like how would you have a secret identity though? Really seriously, you're right. I mean, what do you do? So, in the comics, he's actually basically one of Superboy's rogues gallery because the original Superboy in the comics from the 90s moves to moves to Hawaii before he had a secret identity and before he was Connor or or Connell. He moves to Hawaii and he's like becomes the state superhero of Hawaii and King Shark is one of his supervillains that shows up all the time. So it's it was interesting in this comic to see Superboy getting up in the face of King Shark, which was a yet another excuse, right, to like do a deep cut callback for these oh, things yeah. like that icicle Artemis relationship we were talking about in the last episode. But yeah, Superboy and King Shark, I laughed I laughed loud. Yeah. <laughs> at that one. So um his quip, though, to Shark for that moment just made me laugh way too hard, where he's like... Well, you were talking about the thing where he says about, you can you can try it, but you'll break your teeth. Yeah, though. yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's literally, try me instead, you'll break your teeth, chum. Because he comes chum. in, because he's like, because he literally threatens to, like, eat Miss Martian, and Superboy's like, mm, no. Yeah. Well, so here's here's something else that's kind of interesting. And I was noticing this in the animated series before I read the comic. Chum on the surface to us is like, buddy. Oh, yeah. You know, I mean, like, hey, hey, chum. Yeah. Right? It's also a callback to the 1960s Batman where it was like, you know, come with, a, come with me, chum. You know, like, yeah. obviously chum in an aquatic sense is a whole bunch of dead fish that's used to draw sharks. Yeah. And it's like, it's not good. And all through this issue, King Shark is calling everyone chum who is beneath him, including Topo yeah. and everybody else, or you're going to be my chum or whatever it happens to be. Lagan through the whole second season is turning to Superboy and calling him chum. Yeah. And like, like that kind of stuff through that whole second season. And it's just like. Hey, look, it's another reason why I get frustrated with Lagan because he's so passive aggressive. Is he insulting people and he knows that they don't get it? Oh, but actually Superboy would get it <laughs> because he's literally in this issue with him. Yep. I don't know. Yeah, interesting. I think that it's one of those things that's kind of like a double meaning, passive aggressive. You could say it, and then if somebody's like, uh, "Are you insulting me?" You could be like, "No, no, totally not." I'm just—I mean, you're something my something lost in translation. You're my friend, right. not a bunch. Well, there of are dead definitely fish. there are definitely those words where you're just like, "Your name is what?" <laughs> oh, in my language, that means something very different. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like maybe he's on the surface trying to be like. Oh, chum means buddy? Oh, that's very different. It's <laughs> ironic. That's very different in my language, right? Yeah. I don't know. Could be interesting. All right. Well, enough of my wet trash. <laughs> oh, God. That's just so, oh, such God. We're horrible terrible. images. Every time you oh, say God. that, I'm like, oh, no. I know. I'm sorry. I'm sorry, everyone, for how I am. Oh, we're just we're just excited for for aquatic adventures and <laughs> cute aliens being cute with each other. Right. That's all I want. Uh, let's 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 let everyone off the hook and go to artistic license. Yep. Let's do it. Yep. Let's go. Have all four sidekicks ever been in the same place at the same time? Don't call us sidekicks. In artistic license, we'll be recommending individual issues, miniseries, and graphic novel collections, both from DC and other companies who have titles we think Young Justice fans will enjoy. Artistic license is designed to give you an on ramp into the classic story arcs of the past, so you might catch a glimpse of what's coming in the future. 
Uh, I have three things, and and some of these, I'm, one of these three, I may have mentioned in the past, but I'm going to put it here anyway because it seems appropriate. The first one's called the Atlantis Chronicles, and in the Atlantis Chronicles, uh, writer Peter David, who is a writer on several of the Young Justice episodes as well, it was about seven issues or so, and it actually talks about the history of Atlantis in the DC comics. So there's, I believe there's seven issues, and it actually ends with the birth of Aquaman. The second one I want to mention was an Aquaman miniseries back in 1986. And this one, it was the first solo comic Aquaman had in a very, very long time. But, I mean, there's there's a few reasons why I remember enjoying this uh, miniseries quite a bit. But actually, strangely enough, one of the biggest things I liked about it is they tried to give him a new costume, and I loved it. I loved the new costume. And it unfortunately, it didn't stick but a version of that costume was used for Garth when he became Tempest. I kind of wish Aquaman had kept it. I mean, I'm fine with the orange scale armor, but this one was really cool. Uh, and then the last one I want to mention is one I'm pretty sure I've talked about on the show at some point. And um, it's Aquaman issues number 15 through 20 from earlier in you know the 21st century. I think it was around 2006, 2007 they came out. And it was a story arc called American Title. And... It was a story where San Diego, where I currently live, was uh, dragged into the ocean and a bunch of people died, but a bunch of people discovered that they could actually breathe underwater, but not on the surface. So someone had performed an experiment, like they had been dosing people, I think, in San Diego. I have to read it again. (laughs) They were like dosing people with this thing in San Diego in like the water or whatever, to invoke this metagene kind of thing we're talking about. And then when they, pu- when they caused this ecologic disaster and caused San Diego to get pulled into the ocean, some people died, but other people's metagene got activated and they could breathe underwater, but they couldn't breathe on the surface. And so Aquaman's called in at one point because these people find this, this body of this boy. They're like rescuing people from what they now call Sub Diego. <laughs> and they, they pull this boy out and he's a, or this boy comes walking out of the ocean and he's alive, right? And they don't know why he's alive. And then he ends up dying. And Aquaman comes to see what's going on. And he realizes that it's the, the kid didn't drown like and, and have a traumatic accident in the water and then come out of the water and die. He'd been in the water for an extremely long time. And when he got pulled out of the water, he died. Because his skin was being messed with by... When your skin's in salt water for too long, it causes problems. And so Aquaman was realizing, wait a minute, this kid was down there. Like, there's people alive down there. And so he goes down there and and realizes that there's a a bunch of humans that can now breathe water only there. And he basically recreates a city uh, down there. It's kind of like his Gotham City. (laughs) Becomes kind of interesting. Sounds interesting. Yeah, yeah, it's called American Title. So we'll put links to all three of those in the show notes for everybody. You can link over there and pick them up at Comixology or go down to your friendly local game store and pick those up there. And with that, I think we can wrap up this mission and head out of the Watchtower. You're welcome. So excited. The best way to support the show is to share it with a friend. You can also support us with five-star reviews on Apple Podcasts or your podcatcher of choice. Leaving a rating and review pushes us up in the search ranks and helps other people find the show. And please continue to hashtag buy YJ Comics on Comixology so that you can follow along with us as we be so super excited about everything. And buy the show somewhere online until the DC streaming service launches. You can also now use hashtag Young Justice Outsiders when talking about season three online. And if you want to help us get more episodes, more secret origins, more actual play podcasts, and all of the other cool stuff that we do, please consider supporting us through Patreon. For just a few dollars a month, you can help us do even more with the show while getting some great rewards for yourself. And remember, we're sorry and stay whelmed, everyone. We're so sorry. (laughs) We're so sorry. We love you guys. You've been listening to Whelmed, the Young Justice Files podcast. Our hosts are Rich Howard and Emily Booza. Our editor and producer is Neil Powell. Our theme was composed by Emily Mio. Our logo was created by Kevin Bates. Whelmed is a fan-made podcast and is not officially affiliated with DC Comics, DC Entertainment, Warner Brothers Animation, and any other owners of Young Justice or its related source material. As such, these companies have sole ownership of all symbols, images, names, logos, and proprietary material related to Young Justice. Original content of this podcast is ours under Creative Commons. Thanks for listening, 
and stay whelmed.